Yeah, good morning, everybody. It's good to see you here today. Good, beautiful sunny day out there, a Sunday morning. It's nice to see the sun, and tomorrow we're going to be looking at it, hoping it goes away. So it's Eclipse Sunday, so uh, just remember to be safe with your eye protection. Uh, in case you don't know me, my name is Mark Stadinsky, and I'll be taking you through the announcements today. But before I start, I just want to thank everyone that was involved in our uh, Good Friday service, our Easter morning breakfast, and our Easter service. A lot of people got here early and throughout the week, and a lot of planning and coordinating went into that. And we're just so thankful for everybody making it an extraordinary event. It was really uh, praise the Lord for that. And another praise, we had 20 visitors that day too, so that was really encouraging as well. Uh, we get, uh, and if any of you are visitors and here today returning, welcome. I remember when I, it was right after Easter, I started coming pretty regularly, and I remember, some of you that might remember Tom Smith, he was, a uh, kind of an old pillar in our church, and he used to give candy to all the kids, and, uh, we made eye contact out back there, and I can remember Tom looking at me, and I thought I was going to get a piece of candy, but, uh, <laughs> got eye contact, and he's, he looked at me, and he kind of, make it a habit. I said, oh, okay. <laughs> so so I, ever since then, we made it a habit. So, so thankful for Tom Smith, people like him. If you're new with us today, there is a welcome card in the pew in front of you. Just fill that out, and you can take it to our welcome desk and turn that card in, and there's a small gift to you if you're you know, brand new with us today. And for everybody that's watching online, a special welcome to you as you worship with us as well. We know there's a lot of shut-ins and a lot of people that can't make it out Sundays, and we're just grateful to have you watching online with us as well. And if you want to sign in, there's a text to connect card as well, and you can text to connect with us on, online too. And stay for coffee and refreshments after Sunday or after church. It's right before Sunday school. You're welcome to stay and. Uh, fellowship with us. We have a full line of uh, desserts and goodies downstairs as well as some beverages. So stay in about 20 minutes between the service time and Sunday school time. And Sunday school for all ages. So make sure you take advantage of that. If you're not sure where to go, just see me or pastor or anybody back there on the sound team. and They'll be able to direct you to uh, a place where you can uh, uh, learn more about God's word in Sunday school. And we have a new Sunday school classes starting up today, and we're each going to give a little uh, blog about what's going on with our uh, Sunday schools. And I'm going to I'm going to speak for Rich. Rich's voice is on the mend, but it's been he's saving all he has for Sunday school class, so he's going to be teaching today. But uh, he's uh, he's asked me to read something for him, and I'll just kind of read the the trailer for his class. From Abraham to Joseph to David to Mary, to Paul. God works through people to communicate himself and his word to us. And when God communicated his love, he did it through his son, Jesus Christ. One of the persons God has used has been, perhaps neglected, and yet one of the most important. That's because it was whom God chose to use to bring revival to his wayward people. He is the prophet Elijah. His life is recorded in 1 Kings chapter 17, through 2 Kings chapter 2. So we'll be studying Elijah. It's in the fellowship hall downstairs, and uh, he'll be taking us through the life of Elijah. So, Adam. Uh, so mine starts today, too. It's called God Doesn't Whisper by uh, Jim Osman. Um, <clears throat> this is probably going to be a, a bit of a challenging uh, lesson for some. It's an eight-week lesson, so I mean challenging because it's, uh, it corrects a lot of things. Uh, you know, what do we think about how God speaks to us? Should we hear God's voice? How do we hear uh, God's word? What, how do we make decisions uh, when we have a decision? Do we go left? Do we go right? Is it this job? Is it that job? Um, how should we be hearing from God? And really, how do we not hear from God? So when we grow, we've all kind of grown up, grown up uh, with this Christian kind of mentality of, you know, uh, I hear this, or I look for a sign, or I've seen that. What do we think about those things? How do we discern all that? So this is a, a wonderful correction with all those things of how to, how to hear from God through his word. And so it's, a, again, it's eight-week lessons, um, and it's downstairs in the cafeteria. So. I am Cindy Massaro. I am starting a class for the ladies here in the conference room called Grow with God. 
It will be a basic discipleship class that will just teach fundamentals of the faith, spiritual growth, idols of the heart, dealing with pride, fear, anger, um, marriage issues, parenting issues. It's fantastic if you're a new believer, but also if you have been praying about how you might disciple another young believer to review some of the basics together. Thank you, Adam and Cindy. Looking forward to those classes, so take advantage of them. That's how we grow. This week happening, there's growth groups, there's uh, Davis's Pilgrims, Jones, there's Bible studies, uh, there's men's breakfasts Tuesday and Saturday, and prayer meeting as well. And uh, you can find all those online, or else uh, there's a April calendar out there. You're welcome at the information table. You're welcome to pick that up, and it has all the information on that as well. Offerings. There's blue canisters for our regular monthly or weekly offering out in the uh, back, and there's one downstairs. And also there's a box attached to the wall out there for a benevolent fund, and that goes to the deacon fund, and it goes to help those who might have a need that come up during our deacon meetings that we know that somebody is struggling or may have a need in something, and we're able to help with those issues. Missionary highlights, Bethany Camp. Executive Director Greg Frank, and we're just grateful for all the things that Bethany does. And uh, we're moving forward. They got a big building project going on right now, and we're just thankful for them as well. So why don't we uh, go to the Lord in prayer? Dear Father, we do just thank you for this morning. Father, we just pray as we gather around the communion table that, uh, Father, the, we realize the sacrifice that you made on our behalf to reconcile us to a holy God. Father, we just pray that you would just uh, uh, be our centerpiece, lift up our hearts and worship to you. And Father, we just pray for Pastor as he presents your word that will go forth in power and truth. And we're just thankful for your word that's living and active in our lives. Father, we also pray for uh, uh, Bethany Camp. Father, we just ask that you would just continue to minister to their needs. We think of... Uh, uh, requests they have for more spiritual growth and a, a busy productive spring and summer season for a good core of volunteers uh, and father we just ask that you provide for the resources they need to complete their building projects and father we just lay them before your throne and ask that you're, you'd work a great work among them and that many souls and lives would be dedicated and committed to Jesus Christ through the work at the camp now father we lay this time before you we just ask that you would just magnify yourself to us and we just pray that we'd uh, come together in corporate worship because we love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good morning, everybody. Um, my name is Sarah DeSanto, and this is Casey Springer. We're going to be leading you in worship this morning. Mark Guy is away doing musical things, and um, so please stand with us this morning so we can worship. deep the Father's love for us, how vast beyond all measure, that he should give his only Son to make a wretch his treasure. How great the pain of searing loss, the Which mark the chosen one bring many sons to glory? Behold the man upon a cross, my sin upon him. Ashamed, I hear my mocking voice call out among the scoffers. It was my sin that held him there until it was accomplished. His 
dying breath has brought me life. I know that it is How 
be back with you on this sunny spring day. Today we're going to be talking about community and this is something that is very much part of community. It's possible to have communion on your own but the purpose of it was to see the church gathered together to do something in unity and that's where the word communion ties together with union. As we talk about community, we're going to be talking a little bit more this morning about bearing each other's burdens. A biblical definition of the word forgiveness is one person's willingness to bear the burden or consequences of another person's sin. Let me repeat that for you. This is a definition of forgiveness. One person's willingness to bear the burden or consequences of another person's sin. When you say, I forgive you, biblically you're saying, this is God. We're not going to keep talking about this. I'm not going to keep holding it against you. And if it's something that you've done that has really hurt me, I'm going to bear that hurt because I've forgiven you. And that's the way God forgives us. Bearing a burden means to carry something, like carrying a load for someone else. Sometimes we may do that purely out of love. When we were first married, Cindy had some really severe back issues. And we lived in a second floor apartment with the laundry in the basement. Anybody have that situation at some point in your lives? And there was no way I'm going to let my wife carry the laundry up and down because we had to go outside through the storm doors into the basement and all of that. So. I was ready to carry that burden for her, even though I knew very little about doing laundry. I had a mom who did a lot of that for us, but I carried the burden for her because I loved her. When you pick up for somebody else's um, weakness, sometimes it's backing them up on the ball field, or sometimes it's taking their spot while they're somewhere else in the field. Or maybe you can see that this person is just dragging. They're trying to get their oxygen back and you fill in. You take their spot for them. You're willing to do it. Sometimes we do it out of a sense of obligation and we grumble the whole way as we carry somebody else's burden. Anybody guilty of doing that? I'm doing it, but I'm not liking it. The greatest joy really lies in carrying someone's burden when we do it for love. God did that for us at Calvary. As we celebrated last week at Good Friday, Jesus carried your burdens. He carried my burdens in the form of our sin. 
And what was so special about that was Jesus was guiltless. He was sinless. And yet he took on your sins. He took on my sins. And he carried that burden to the cross. He paid the penalty, which was death. And the reason that that was so special is because this was a one-time sacrifice. Jesus carried all of our sins for the people who had died before, the people who hadn't even lived yet. He carried the burdens of our sin to Calvary. And he offers forgiveness. So as we come to the communion table, we remember this sacrifice. We remember Christ carrying our burdens. Not only should we be thinking about the sacrifice, but it was the way that he made it. Jesus did it out of love. Hanging on the cross, he said, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. He loved us while he was carrying our burden. He didn't do it grudgingly. He did it joyfully. So he's our supreme example. He forgave us at the greatest cost that any person could pay, his own life. He did it willingly, and he did it complete, completely. So as we remember the sacrifice, we have to remember that Jesus said, go and do likewise. Forgive as you have been forgiven. Carry each other's burdens. So this morning as we're coming to the communion table. The men are going to pass out the elements, which are the bread and the cup. And they are stacked together. If you haven't been here before, you're going to take the juice out, the top cup, and the bottom cup has the bread in it, and you'll be all set. So as the plates come by, you can take that and be ready to share in communion with us. Scripture gives some instructions about communion. This is something for believers only. This is for someone who understands what the body and blood of Jesus Christ are. And if you have your kids with you, this is your own decision with your family. But what we did with our kids was we decided that when they were ready to be baptized, when they understood that symbol, then they were ready for the symbol of communion. But you can make that decision with your families and you can decide how you're going to do that. The only people that should not take communion are those who are unbelievers, those who have not trusted Jesus Christ as Savior. Paul also said we need to forgive each other. So if we have something against another brother or sister and we haven't forgiven them, we should do that before we come to the communion table. Or if there's something you need to be forgiven of, you should take care of that. So each month as we're preparing for communion, it shouldn't come as a surprise. It's always on the first Sunday of the month. So the Saturday before that, we should be praying, we should be thinking about, are there things in my life that I need to get right so that I can take communion with a pure heart and be ready? Paul said, when you come together in eating the Lord's Supper, let a person examine himself and eat of the bread and then drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body, eats and drinks judgment on himself. Not only discerning the body of Christ, but the discerning the body of believers that we're together in, in community. Have you set things right with your brothers and sisters? So we're going to have a time for you to pray as the men are passing out the elements. Come on up, guys. We'll have a time where the music is just playing softly and you can pray and you can receive the items as they come through. And then we'll take our communion together at the end of that.
the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your love for us. We thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, who was willing to carry our burdens to the cross. Thank you for the forgiveness that is offered through Christ's blood. And thank you that we could join together as a body of believers, brothers and sisters in Christ, who have this in common. We have unity in Jesus Christ. We thank you for your sacrifice. Thank you for your forgiveness. Thank you for loving us and offering us salvation. In the name of Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen. Truth, the light, star of the morning. 
Let love be genuine. Abhor what is evil, hold fast to what is good, love one another with brotherly affection, outdo one another in showing honor. Do not be 
slothful in zeal, be fervent in spirit, serve the Lord, rejoice in hope, be patient in tribulation, be constant in prayer, contribute in the needs of saints, and seek to show hospitality. <clears throat> Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Rejo rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Never be wise in your own sight. Repay with one evil for evil, but but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peacefully with all. Showing community. And thank you, Casey, for helping us with worship this morning. Good morning again. I'm Pastor Mark. If those of you are joining us online for the first time, we're really glad that you're here with us. It's good to be back with you. We were away for the last couple of weeks in between Good Friday and Easter. And this morning we are wrapping up our sermon series, Let It Change You. But before we get there, this is Family Worship Sunday. So our kids are staying in the service with us. We do have nursery for up through four years old. So if you need to take your kids out, you can, but we are glad to have you all with us. And kids, in the bulletin or on the clipboard, you have a place where you can take notes. And so if you want to bring up your notes afterwards and show me that you were listening and doing your best to pay attention, then I've got some little gifts for you and Adults, if you want to take notes, you can do that too. I'm not going to give you a prize. You just have the satisfaction and joy of staying awake through church, which is something good to do. So we've been looking at the ways that God changes us by his amazing grace and his loving mercy. On Palm Sunday, we saw that prayer is a gift from God, helping us move from anxious people to people of peace. And that requires that we humble ourselves, asking God for help and bringing our concerns to Jesus. Last week on Easter Sunday, we discovered that the good news of the resurrection has the power to change our hearts and our lives because of Jesus' victory over sin and death. As believers, we no longer have to fear death because we know that our Savior is waiting for us on the other side of life. We celebrated my mom's funeral last week, a week ago, and it was a celebration. We sang a lot of songs. I don't know if the funeral home was used to that, but we sang songs that were favorites of my mom's. And we had family members come up and share stories. And we had family members sing and then as we gathered for the meal, as we gathered for a time of fellowship, there was rejoicing because mom is in heaven, and I'm so thankful for that. And I know many of you have loved ones that you're looking forward to seeing again, but right now, people talk about them looking down on us and thinking about us and what we're doing. I think they're just glorying in the presence of Jesus Christ, amen? I can only imagine what it's like. That song so beautifully captures that to be in heaven, to be with God, and yes, for that reunion that we look forward to. So because of the empty tomb, our lives can change. The power, God says, that resurrected Jesus Christ from the dead is the same power through his Holy Spirit that can change you, that can change your heart, that can change the hearts of those that you love. If you have family members that you just struggle with loving Know that God can change them and be ready to forgive them as God has forgiven you, to be patient with them as God has been patient with you. 
and know that God can, will continue to work on your heart and work on mine. That is such an encouragement that God never says, you know what, Mark? That was the last straw. I've forgiven you enough times. I just don't have it in me to do it one more time. That's something God will never say because his mercies are new every morning. His love is always there saying, I'm offering you forgiveness. Come back into fellowship with me. So today we're looking at how Christ-centered community can further change us and transform our lives. It's not just the Holy Spirit working on us alone, but it's a community of believers that he's given us. Have you ever noticed that some things just go better when they're together? Like Oreos. Who likes Oreos? Who can finish off a sleeve of Oreo without batting their eye? Isn't it amazing how they just keep jumping into your mouth? But Oreos with milk, wow, that's something that is just amazing. What about popcorn with a movie? Just walking into the theater and smelling the oily slash buttery popcorn that smells so good you just want to eat that while you're enjoying the movie. Peanut butter, love it. But when you mix in some jelly and some nice, soft, squishy bread, oh, that's good too. Peanut butter and bananas, the Elvis fried sandwich. That is good stuff if you've ever had that. Batman without Robin, peas without carrots, bacon with anything? Is there anything that is bad with bacon? I haven't tasted it yet. Some things like these are pretty good on their own, but when you combine them, they're spectacular combinations when they're put together. This is true for these little things, these little joys in life. And imagine as God was creating things, he's just watching us discover these combinations. Like, I made lima beans, but when you put them with butter and corn and a little salt and pepper, wow, that's a good thing. He's just waiting for us to discover these combinations. Beef and anything, kind of like bacon. But when it comes to a Christ-centered relationship, people that you meet in church, we live in a community with one another. We learn lessons, we grow in ways that simply would not happen in isolation. As Cindy and I were driving home from Ohio, we saw a monastery. I don't know if we were on Route 5, but within half a mile, there was a convent. So there's a monastery and a convent, and people are living on their own, secluded from people. And I just wonder if they know how much they're missing by not being part of a church family, being part of the body of Christ, worshiping together. Because life is lived best when it's in a deeper communion with others. We are better together. Can you say that with me? Better together. Say it like you mean it. Thank you. Think about a memory from your past. You don't have to say it out loud. Just think about a good memory from your past. You have one? It may be a favorite memory, and it's most likely a favorite memory, not just because of what you were doing, but who you were doing it with, the people that you were with. And there's something about a shared life that is a full life. We were created for community. This desire is so obvious today as our culture spends more and more time on social media. I have a little thing that pops up on my phone on Sundays that says, you spent 30 minutes less on your phone than you did last week. And I think, wow, that's not a whole lot. I was really trying this week. Or it'll say, you spent an hour and a half more than you spent the previous week. And it's just amazing how much time we spend on our phones. We're on Facebook. We're on Twitter. We're on all kinds of apps to connect with people. Twitter X, sorry. I know that that changed. We're on Snapchat. We're on Instagram. We're checking up on each other's lives because we want connection. We want people to like what we're doing, and we want to see what they're doing. This is something that, especially when you have a family that's spread out like mine, you have the joy of seeing little bits and glimpses of their lives. We want to know people, and we want them to know us. 
connections with others has been hardwired into us. We are created to be in community, and that's clearly seen in the creation narrative in the very first book of the Bible. If you want to turn with me to Genesis chapter 2, we're going to be there for just a brief time. But Genesis 2, 18 says, after, doesn't say it here, but after God had created all of the things, and every day he said, it was good. It was good. It was very good. Then the Lord said, it is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. Someone suited just for him. Someone to live life with. We are created to share our lives with others. And in the very beginning of the Bible, when God created the first human being, as he said, everything is good, then he said, wait, there's something not good. And this didn't surprise God. Did it ever come to your recognition that nothing ever surprises God? Did you ever realize that? That God never says, oh, there's no aha moments for God because he knows it all. Kind of takes some of the surprise out of things, but maybe he's just joyful when we make those good choices. He sees them, he knows they're happening, but he still has joy. God said, the one good thing that I made man, it's not good that he would be alone. So God created Eve to be a companion for Adam, to be a partner with, to grow with him. And this concept of community shows up again and again in Jesus' ministry. If you want to turn with me to the Gospel of John chapter 17, just hours before Jesus is going to be arrested, he was praying in the garden. And we talked about that during Palm Sunday, that Jesus prayed for us. He prayed that if there's any other way, God, that this cup could be removed from me, I'll do that. But I'm ready to accomplish your will. I'm ready to take on the burden of all the sins of the world. I'm ready to obey you, God. And sometime during that prayer, when he could have continued to pray for himself, Jesus was praying for the community of people who have followed him. Listen to John 17, verses 20 and 21. This is part of Jesus' prayer. I do not ask for these only, he's talking about the disciples, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. Jesus was praying for his disciples that they would stick together, that they would have unity as they're facing this worst, darkest day in their lives. They're seeing their Savior, their Messiah, their Rabbi crucified. And Jesus is praying, Father, keep them together, hold them together, but not just them. He prays for those who would come next. Do you see yourself in there? Father, I desire that not just them, but those who will believe in me through their word. The people who have yet to be born, that's you, that's me. The people who are going to believe in Jesus Christ because of the word of the disciples, the apostles, as they shared who Jesus was, as they shared the gospel, they shared the great things that he did. We believe in Jesus through their words and through the Holy Spirit. And Jesus said, I pray for them. He doesn't pray for protection. He doesn't pray that God would defeat the evil one. He prays that his followers would be one, that we would be united, that we would have unity together, that we would be a community of saints. And Jesus knows all the things that were about to face those disciples. He knew that many of them would be martyred. All of them would have their lives attempted on. John is one of the few that they were unsuccessful in killing him. But the disciples would scatter as they first heard the, the news that Jesus died. 
Only John, as far as we know, stood and watched at the cross. The rest of them had taken off. They heard about it secondhand, and they stayed in hiding. Jesus prayed that they would be unified. He prayed that they would get together and that they would stay together. And he says, this is the way that I want their unity to be, just like our unity, Father. Just like I'm in you and you are in me, I want them to be with us. And he's describing the biblical concept of the Trinity. That word doesn't actually appear anywhere in the Bible. And some people have said, well, how can there be a Trinity if there is no Trinity spelled out? But this, like many other places, tells us that the Father and the Son are one. And he said, I'm sending the Comforter, the Holy Spirit, so that I could be with you even to the end of the ages. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We see that in Jesus' baptism. We see it in the transfiguration. There are times where the Father is speaking, the Spirit appears, and Jesus is standing there. They're all there at the same time. The apostles wrote a good deal about the Holy Spirit's role as he would come and not only be the comforter, but he would remind them of what Jesus had taught them. He would be Christ's presence with them and with us so that we would have communion with the Father and the Son as well. In the beginning, we were created in the image of God. The God who has existed from eternity past and will exist into eternity future in perfect relationship. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Three distinct persons and yet one. While this doctrinal concept is kind of a mystery to us, how can we understand that there's one God but he's three parts. It's a core tenet of our faith, and it's a central piece of who God is, the fact that God lives in community. The way he relates to himself is the way he relates to us and the way he wants us to relate with each other, to live in a relationship where we lean on each other, where we know each other, Christ-centered relationships that will help us grow and change. So the most meaningful relationship in my life I've enjoyed in marriage. Is Cindy back there? Cindy and I were married back in the olden days, 1991. You remember the 1900s? Anybody that old? Remember them? We'll be celebrating our 33rd anniversary. I know I look so much younger than that. But this June, 33 years that Cindy has put up with me. And we found that a good marriage is not a 50-50 relationship. If we put in 50% each, we are still missing out in the middle. We're committed to a 100%, 100% relationship. And God calls us to model the Trinity even in our marriages, in our relationship with one another. God is the one that we should seek to love and glorify the most. And then our spouse will naturally be loved best when we do that. I've shared this illustration in premarital counseling and even in counseling couples when they come in and say, we could use a tune-up for our marriage. I share that this is what the relationship looks like. You're not trying to meet in the middle and do your 50%. You are trying to glorify God in everything. Your goal is to obey God, to submit to Him, to submit to His Word in everything. And as you do that, as you grow closer and closer to God, you can see what happens in that pyramid. The separation between the two of you gets smaller and smaller and smaller. And when you're at a place where you're both reaching out to be as close to Jesus as you can, you're going to be loving your spouse as God does. You're going to be quick to forgive. You're going to be ready to believe. You're going to be desiring to glorify God even in that relationship. Just as you're called to glorify God in work, in your entertainment, in your church life, in everything, You're supposed to glorify God in your marriage. He wants us to give and receive from each other every day of our lives. 
And as we love God more and more, we're putting our own needs as second. And we're putting our spouse's needs first. And that's the way we keep changing. We keep seeing ourselves as the one who has things to offer. What can I do for you? How can I love you? And we stop seeing ourselves as the most important person in the world. Some of you have parents who maybe still tell you that you're the most important person in the world. Don't listen to them. That's wrong. You are not the most important person in the world. Jesus Christ is and was the most important human, but our goal is to look outward, to care about other people, to be humble, to be sacrificial, to be generous and faithful, and not to do that alone, to do it together. So as we seek to glorify God in everything, we live in godly relationships with each other. We are meant for and created for community. We're also called to carry one another's burdens. And these are fill in the blanks in your notes in case you're wondering where these things came from. So just hours before his death, as we talked about, Jesus wasn't focused on himself. He was praying for his disciples. He was praying for unity, for oneness. And there is real power in a Christian community that takes its cues from how it should relate to each other with grace, mercy, compassion, and love. One of the reasons that we're better together is because there's power in being able to say, I'm with you. Listen to Galatians 6, 1 to 5. Brothers and sisters, if anyone is caught in any transgression, sin, you who are spiritual should restore him or her in a spirit of gentleness. Keep watch on yourself lest you too be tempted. Bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. For if anyone thinks he is something, when he is nothing, he deceives himself. But let each one test his own work, and then his reason to boast will be in himself alone and not in his neighbor. For each one will have to bear his own load. Look at each other. Love each other. Bear one another's burdens. And be ready to say, I'm with you. One of the best ways that a Christian community, a church comes together, is helping each other carry the heavy load of life. Has everybody lived on easy street? Your life's been perfect? No problems? Anybody like that? There's probably someone in the church family who has gone through what you're going through right now. Or maybe they've gone through something that you've gone through before. And they can honestly say, I know how that feels. I'm with you. That person may be the perfect person to help you find strength and courage, to see that someone else was able to make it through this and keep glorifying God. For someone else to not huddle into a corner and say, I'm just quitting everything. I'm going to be alone because I can't do this. God says, I know. That's why I gave you brothers and sisters. That's why I gave you a church family. Can you help me illustrate this? Who's willing? Wow, look at all those yeses. I'd invite you to just briefly stand up. If you've ever been broken up with, anybody ever been broken up with? Look at each other and say, I'm with you. All right, sit down. Stand up if you've ever had a friend let you down. A friend who let you down. Look at each other and say, I'm with you. All right, sit down again. Stand up if you've ever lost someone you loved. Look at each other and say, I'm with you. You can sit down. Kids, are you listening? Stand up if you've ever had a really bad day at school. Kids, ever had a bad day at school? Look at each other and say, I'm with you. You can sit down. 
There's power in being able to look at someone next to you and say, I can relate. I know how you feel. To go from sympathy to empathy. I know what that feels like. Can I pray with you? Can I pray for you? Can we get together and talk about this? I'm with you. You don't have to go through this alone. Jesus knew that there would be hard days for us. Days where we would struggle. Things that would challenge us that we shouldn't face alone. And so he prayed for unity. He prayed for togetherness. So that when we feel alone, when we feel like there's no one else that can relate to what we're struggling with. That there's no one else that has this sin problem. I'm the only messed up one. Nobody else is struggling with this. When we are struggling and feeling like, I'm never going to get over this breakup. I'm never going to get past this addiction. I'm never going to get over this pain. That we can look at someone else and say, I'm with you. God is with you. Let's pray together. How can I encourage you? I don't want you to face this alone. When you look around church and think everybody else has a hallmark perfect romance. When you look at another family and say, how do they all get here wearing two of the same shoes and dressed and relatively clean and think, oh, their lives must be so perfect that we could look at each other and say, I know what it's like on a Sunday morning. I'm with you. We're encouraged to see how God is faithful in the lives of others. That encourages us as we watch older people in our church or even just other people in our church go through struggles and we say, okay, there's light at the end of the tunnel. They made it through this. We can make, this, make it through this too. To hear from someone else and have our faith deepened when we see God walking through the valleys with others. Our oldest son, who you have not met, was dealing with major disappointments and extreme anger as a teenager. He was fighting for more independence, and he was ripping apart the peace of our family. There were days where we were just hoping that it would be relatively quiet and peaceful. So in exasperation, we shared those hurts, finally getting past our pride, and we asked others in the church family to pray with us. We learned that we weren't the only people dealing with these kind of problems. And we realized that even as families that we saw in church looked like everything was together, and they were aiming for godly homes like we were, they had problems too. We saw that many had similar battles, and they were more willing to talk about it. Parents who unfortunately thought that parent, pastors' families were always perfect felt like now they could ask for prayer. They could ask for help too because they saw that we had struggles like they had. The passage that I just read in Galatians tells us that we should bear each other's burdens that we should take some of that weight off of their shoulders, help them bring it to Jesus and say, cast all your cares on him because he cares for you. And then literally to take some of those burdens. Can I help you with your kids on Sunday morning? Could I swing by and help put their shoes on or whatever it's going to be? Can I help you with this tough time that you're going through? Can I take your son or daughter out for a cup of coffee and encourage them? Can I come pray with you? Can I help restore your faith? Can I restore your courage? And it says, don't be tempted yourself to think that you've got it all together. I asked before if any of you had no problems, and I didn't see anyone say yes, but sometimes we feel like we're the only ones struggling, and we feel like we can't admit it. Or we may have been going through such a good patch that we start thinking, oh, this is us doing it. We've raised up godly children and they're going the right way because of we've done all of the things right. And we start forgetting that it's God who's holding things together and that we need to go back to God and continue to ask for help. In community, we're encouraged by others 
as we carry one another's burdens. And that starts to change us. We humble our hearts and we help each other. The final point is that community needs to be intentional. The early church is described in the book of Acts. And the church was now living out the heart of Jesus' prayer and that Trinitarian relationship that was modeled in Genesis. Listen to Acts 2, verses 42 to 47. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers, and awe came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. They were selling their possessions and belongings. They were distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. Day by day, they were attending the temple together. They were breaking bread in their homes. They received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. There was a deep sense in the early church that they needed each other over meals, during prayer, by meeting the needs of those around them. They demonstrated the life of faith is truly better together. God's desire was for the world to see that this Jesus movement was not just a flash in the pan. Instead, it was the beginning of something that would change the world. It would turn the world upside down. That's the description that the, Ro- the Romans had of what the apostles were doing. You better stop them. They're turning the world upside down as they share the love of Christ with those in their communities. This unity of new followers in Jesus was demonstrating that God was the one at work. And when we, looked at, when we look at some of the things mentioned in these verses, it resulted in the salvation of souls. People said, I want to be part of this. I can't believe that you love each other. You look like you have nothing in common with each other, and yet there's something special here. I want that too. And that's the Holy Spirit, first of all, convicting us that we need God, but also seeing a loving family and saying, I want to be part of that. If you came to church this morning and everybody growled at you, or if you saw frowns on the faces and you heard people yelling at each other, would you want to stay? You stayed, so I'm hoping that didn't happen to you this morning. But that would be a really sad day in church to come together and just be mad at each other. Hey, you're in my seat. That's my parking spot. This bit of creamer is for me. I brought it three weeks ago, so just hand it over. Not sharing, wanting everything for yourself. Instead, the early church was focused on loving each other. They didn't spend money on ad campaigns. They didn't spend money on fancy buildings. They ate meals together. They prayed together. They simply liked being together. They gathered together in each other's homes. And as they were meeting, they experienced the power of God in their midst. They saw God changing each other's hearts. The Holy Spirit showed up and they were empowered not only to change but to love each other, to meet each other's needs. Mark mentioned the brown box, the benevolent offering. That's one of the ways that we meet each other's needs. So when you come to our church, we don't ask you to sell your house and give us all your money. We don't tell you that you can't outgive God, so just keep giving until you have nothing left. We don't tell you that. We encourage our members to give regularly so that we can keep the lights on and we can Keep heat in the building and we can replace the carpet every 50 years. But we also want to take care of people's needs. So once a month we talk about a benevolent offering and you can drop money in that box anytime. But as you hear about a need, whether it's in your own family or someone else in the church family, a neighbor, let us know. Let one of the deacons know, let me know, and we want to help show people love and share some of those needs. We have the food pantry box out front. You can bring in food for that, and people can just come and get it. And when they open the box, they see a gospel tract, and they know, hey, this church cares about me. 
And I hope they know God's love and they're willing to come in and hear the good news. All of the things mentioned here, these activities of getting together, eating together, praying together, they're all things that we do in small groups. We call them growth groups because that's what we think the focus is, that we should be growing spiritually. We should be growing together as brothers and sisters in Christ. You may already have friends. Anybody have a friend? It's good. If you don't have a friend, come to a growth group. You'll meet some new ones. You like spending time with people, but what if you did that with more intention? What if you did it with purpose? I'm not talking about having an Amway meeting, tricking people. I'm saying have people over and share something that God did in your life this week. Share something that you want to pray for them about and ask them if there's anything you can pray for. This is usually one of the ways that most people are willing to share something about themselves. Is there anything I could pray for you this week? And a lot of times people say, no, no, I'm fine. But they may open up and share something. And you can offer to pray for them. You can pray with them. Inviting Jesus into those moments, intentionally spending time together so that they can see your faith and hear about what God is doing in your life. As you go shopping, as you change the oil in the car, as you Uh, clean up something around the church, invite somebody to be with you, to be intentional. 1 Thessalonians 4.18 says, comfort or encourage one another with the good news that Jesus is returning. When people are struggling and it feels like their lives are just blowing up, the reminder that not only did Jesus say, I'm never going to leave you, but I'm going to come again for you. I'm going to go through this with you. So here are two very practical things that you can do. First of all, we need to encourage each other going forward, that we want more for one another that we often want for ourselves. Being willing to see a God-given potential, that there's a full life within each one of us. It's being willing to say hard things in love and being willing and ready to receive some of those hard things too. Because that's how we are really going to change and grow. Do you have any good friends? Would you be willing for that good friend to tell you that your zipper is unzipped? Or that there's toilet paper on the bottom of your shoe? Would you want them to say that to you? To stop you from embarrassment? Would you want them to say, the way you just talked to your kid was really harsh. It was dropped cookie. It wasn't something that was so terrible. Can you show more love and compassion when you do that? It's hard to hear these things, but if we're willing to share those kind of things with each other, we're going to grow and change because we know that we have somebody who loves us, that cares about us, and is not saying this to embarrass us. They're not saying it in front of everyone else. Proverbs said, faithful are the wounds of a friend, a friend that's willing to gently poke you in the front instead of stab you in the back, right? That's what a friend is, someone who's willing to confront you with problems and being willing to say, would you tell me when you see me or hear me doing something that is not honoring to Christ? Would you be willing to tell me that so that I can grow? I want to have that kind of relationship with somebody. Not everyone is going to be that close a friend, But to have a few that are willing to talk like that is going to help. Someone who cares more about the health of your family, the health of your marriage, and willing to say, here's some things I'm worried about. They care more about your spiritual growth than anything else. We're better together when we're willing to encourage each other going forward. And secondly, we have to be ready to be there no matter what. Do you have any friends like that? One of my friends in Indiana, Charlie, was, it was and is willing to drive four hours if my car was stuck somewhere and say, just give me a call, I'll be there. It's the kind of guy that would show up anytime to help with a problem. To have friends like that, to be there when times are tough when it's not convenient, when it's not the best time. 
As a pastor, something I'm really encouraged by is when I hear about a problem, I hear that someone is struggling, and I either make a phone call or I reach out to them or I stop by and I find out someone has already been there. Someone from the church family has already brought them a meal or stopped in to pray or they've received a card. That is so encouraging to see our church family loving each other well. Don't ever think that it's not your place to reach out to someone and say, I'm praying for you. It's not embarrassing. They shouldn't receive it as, oh, do I need prayer? I hope you know you do. If you ever think that, remember that God says, I want you to live in this kind of community. I want you to be there for each other. As a church family, we need to make a commitment to be there for each other, to look for opportunities to bring each other hope because we are the hands and feet of Jesus. He literally left earth and went back to heaven where he has a physical body. We are his hands and feet. We're the ones here that can reach out and help a neighbor with a fence or bring someone a meal or get down on our knees and pray with somebody. Or maybe it's just crying with somebody who's struggling. Are you willing to do that? Are you willing to be there for each other? That's what we are looking for in church members. When we make a covenant, we say, I promise to be there for you. And that's what we're asking people to join. On April 21st, we're having an intro class And that's where you learn more about how to become part of First Baptist Church. You're part of the worship service this morning, but to be part of the body means that you're making that commitment saying, I want people to be here for me, and I'm going to be here for other people too. So I'd invite you to join us on the 21st. There's a sign-up sheet out at the Welcome Center. We'll have lunch. You'll hear all about our church, and you'll have an opportunity to ask questions and see what it's like to be part of a family. So some takeaways briefly this morning before you have a time of community, coffee, and hopefully go to one of those great Sunday school classes. Here's some baby steps. Have you stayed for coffee and refreshments? We have people who have come to our church for years and have never had the ladies' amazing baked goods. They are really good. They are really good. That's why I have to keep going on diets every spring because our ladies and some of the men are great cooks and bakers. Come down and have coffee, have some refreshments, get a chance to talk to people. It's downstairs in the cafeteria area. The next step after that, while you're enjoying coffee and having a cookie, you can just slowly find a seat in one of those Sunday school classes. There are three different adult classes going on and there are classes for every age from the nursery up through our teenagers. You'll get an opportunity to hear more and talk more. So give that a try. And then growth groups. I think we have three different ones going on this week. They meet on different nights of the week, different times. We have four different locations all together. And if you're not a talker, you can just come and listen. You don't have to say a single word. You could wear a name tag that says, I'm not talking. That's fine. Laryngitis. Put that on your name tag. Sorry, Rich. Can't talk. Just going to listen. That's okay. Hopefully, you'll get to know people, and you'll pray with people. You'll enjoy food with people, and you'll make some friendships where you know that people care about each other. We're going to have a fifth group starting up. I think next month. So there's opportunities for you to be part of one of those. If you want to grow even deeper and you're looking for one of those relationships where someone is going to tell you something seems a little bit off, brother. Something, sister, is just doesn't seem right. Are you okay? To have that kind of a closer relationship, to maybe go through some basic doctrine of, of Scripture together, to learn more about how to be a Christian, how to follow Jesus Christ, you could have a smaller discipleship class, maybe just a couple people. And if you especially are new to church or new to God's word, that's a great place to be able to just talk through what does it look like to follow Jesus Christ. If you stop by the Welcome Center, you can leave your name there and we'll find 
somebody to have a Bible study with you. If all of this community, all of this love, all of this caring and sharing and crying together just sounds too good to be true, or maybe it's scary because you're not a crier, hugger kind of person, the most important relationship you need in your life is to have peace with God, to know your heavenly Father, to know the creator of the universe, and know his son Jesus Christ, who was willing to carry your sin and my sin to carry our burdens to the cross, to pay for them with his own life, to offer you forgiveness, to offer you peace, to have your slate wiped clean, to stand before God and say, I am your son, I'm your daughter, and for God to say, welcome home. If you've never had that moment in your life, then I would invite you to come talk to me after the service. If you're watching online, you can contact me through the church website, but you need to humble yourself and recognize that you're a sinner in need of a Savior. It's not just good enough to come to church and feel good for a couple hours on Sunday. God says, I want to know you. I want to do life with you. And I want you to have a family to do life with. You can ask Jesus to be your Lord and Savior. And you can become part of God's family. I'm not going to invite Mark to come up because he's far away right now. He's out in Illinois. But I am going to pray and dismiss you. I hope you stay for refreshments. I hope you stay for Sunday school. At least stop by the Welcome Center and talk to somebody there. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this morning. Thank you that we could spend time talking about the community that you designed, the fellowship that you want us to have with you and with each other. Thank you, Lord, for a church family that loves each other, that loves us. Thank you that we can do life together. And I thank you, Lord, for each one that has come this morning. I pray that anyone that needs to know Jesus as their Savior today would be the day. And for anyone that wants to take that next step in become part of a, becoming part of a church family, that today would be a good day to do that as well. Lord, we thank you and praise you for giving us your word. Thank you for your son, Jesus Christ. Thank you for the brothers and sisters sitting around us who could say together, I'm with you. We've experienced life together and we're here to carry each other's burdens to encourage one another. Finally, brothers and sisters, rejoice. Encourage one another. Aim for restoration. Comfort one another. Agree with one another. Live in peace. And the God of love and peace will be with you all. In the name of Jesus Christ, the friend of sinners, who offers salvation through his sinless blood, I pray. Amen.